The question is a motion be agreed to. The Honourable the Treasurer, Mim for Dundas. After two weeks of, of essentially studied abuse by the opposition to the government, in particular the Prime Minister, what we've just heard from the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the National Party are the most pathetic contributions I've heard in such a weighty debate in my 22 years here. I can, I can say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, Sir John McEwen and Mr Doug Anthony would wince if they, they, they would never be capable of such a pathetic performance as you as you had. And as far as you're concerned, unless you're scripted, you're useless. Order. Unless you're scripted, you're Order. useless. Oh no, Jack Lang will be very happy with my performance as old son. Very happy. Now let me tell you, Mr Speaker, unless he's in with a question in his hand written by someone on his staff and with a speaker, he's useless. Useless. Absolutely. In oh, fact, Mr Speaker, it's an insult to one's professional skills to have to be in such a debate. They have to be in such a debate with these pathetic, uh, with these pathetic. Uh, what the leader of the opposition did was produce a noisy, empty speech, a, an, a totally noisy, empty speech. He thought bluster and volume and decibels were to there for, for, for substitute for quality, quantity to substitute for quality, and amplitude and noise to substitute for real argument. Because he is the accuser. He is accused in this, this, of this matter, and after two weeks, what did he come up with? Well, I'll tell you what he came up with, uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy Dundas. Speaker. He said the government should govern for everyone, not just its special friends, was his first point. His second point was on the Prime Minister's inability to remember what he referred to as a selective amnesia. On three, his third point was doing deals, and his his, his pathetic closing remarks were about the Liberal Party having a declared code of conduct no, no, no. and finally said there was no change of policy on their part, and I presume in relation to gold. Now let me, let me uh, deal with those points. And these are the essential points. Mr Speaker, let me deal with those points. His first point is the government should govern everyone and not just special friends. Senator Cheney has made a virtue of the fact that he believes in special friends and distortions which he describes that he supports. That is, special friends, special friends. Oh, we know all about your friends on the racetrack, pal. We know all about your racetrack friends, pal. Mr, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. 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 Uh, Order, Mr. Deputy for Speaker, um, uh, Order, the, the, member for the member for Pearce has made all these things about distortions, Order, Yong, about distortions. And yet the Leader of the Opposition got the, got the gall to talk about special friends when they've in fact changed their policy and removed their leader to change their policy. And he talks about special friends uh, and governing for everybody. Then he gets up and says with the Leader of the National Party, we should be discussing, he was fuming at the end of his speech about how we should be on national issues. The great national issues, he said, and a recession, and he referred to the 1930s. But what's the MPI about? The need for Prime Minister to give a full and coherent explanation of WA Inc. That's your great national issue. That's your great national issue. Then he referred the Prime Minister to selective amnesia. But what, of course, did uh, the member for uh, the member for Benelong say when he was asked about uh, the meeting with Mr Bond? I can't give you a verbatim account of every minute detail of a conversation. And could you have a conversation four years ago? I mean, that's not an issue. But I can remember the substance discussions. Now there we are. He's. He, as I said in the House earlier this week, the member for Ben Long blew the leader of the opposition's case apart when he said, Don't, you can't impugn the Prime Minister over selective amnesia when I myself am saying I can't be expected to remember what I said in a meeting four years ago. That's what he said. That's what he have said. That's what you've implied. That's what you've implied. Absolutely what you implied. Of course it is. There's your quotation. There's your, there's your quotation. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and then... Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, there was no. And then you've got to talk about no change of policy when we find all these press releases from senators about all the glitters and your letter. And then we have this very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, issue of Senator Je Senator Durack actually telling the Senate, actually he's telling the Senate about the written letter undertaking from the member for Benelong two weeks before the undertaking was actually published. Ah. He's in the Senate saying so. I've got the references here into the Senate debate of Senator Durack saying this. And yet you've got and yet you've got the you've got the absolute temerity to try and suggest there was no change of policy on your part. 
The fact is, the fact is Mr Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition Mr. parades Kiyo. himself as a person of integrity. What we, he was do, doing was impugning the reputation of the Prime Minister while he knew of the member for Pearce's position. He was happy to stand up here and impugn the reputation of the Prime Minister, knowing one of his own front, be front bench had asked the same person, asked and received $50,000 from the same person. Now, what person of integrity, how could he describe himself as a person of integrity when he's up impugning the motives of the Prime Minister, the Chief Minister of the Government, saying he'd shifted his policy when one of his own front bench had been to the same person in question, the said Mr Connell, and had asked and received $50,000. That's what this person of integrity, in inverted commas, is supposed to, have, supposed to have us believe as he puts these questions. He also knew that the press report, while he was putting these questions to the Prime Minister, he knew of the press report of uh, reporting Alan Bond saying that fundraising did not arise during discussions. Because when I referred to Mr Howard's meeting with Bond, he said, oh, we know all about that. We've seen that report. Yes, you'd seen the report. You'd also seen the paragraph above, where the spokesman for Mr Bond said the question of fundraising did not arise during discussions. And the fact of the matter is, you knew that, but it wasn't going to put you off your dirty game, was it? It wasn't going to put you off your dirty game, was it? I mean, you, as an ideas person, someone new in public life, not besmirched by the rest thing. What a joke. And let me not hear from the press gallery ever again about this as a non-political person. I mean, frankly, frankly, we'll, we'll, we'll faint if we hear that again, that this person is an ideas person, not really out of the mould of most politics, just a common or garden liberal, just a common or garden conservative right-wing hack. Who will, try and, who will try and besmirch an honest man's reputation to uh, an honest person's reputation for just cheap political advantage. Now, Mr. That's, now that's your position. You've asked these questions knowing nothing. You know he had got 50,000 and you knew of the bond report, but you asked these questions for two weeks. That's what you did. You fraud. You disgraceful, disgusting fraud. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order, 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 Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, order, the uh, order, the honourable member for Mr. Deputy Speaker. I ask that the Deputy Prime Minister withdraw I'm those remarks. Joe, of course I won't withdraw. Of course I won't withdraw. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and what about the impropriety? Order. No impropriety order. was committed, or could be established by you. No impropriety could be established. Disgusting is not unparliamentary, you clown. Of order. Order. Go and sit down. Oh, sit down. No, you sit order. down. Order. This the parliament's not for you. The it's for order. all of us. Order. The Mr for Deputy you. Speaker, point of order. On, on, a point, on a point of order, with the uproar in the House, Mr Deputy Speaker, I did not hear your ruling. I assume that you asked the Deputy Prime Minister to withdraw. In, in, in this debate, it's a very robust debate. The, the, it doesn't matter. The only, requirement, the only requirement is that members do not use unparliamentary language or impute improper motives to others, to others or, 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 or impute improper motives to others without a specific motion. I call the honourable treasurer. Mr. Speaker, that's why it's a censure motion. Mr. Speaker, no impropriety was committed or could be established by you. In two weeks, no impropriety was established by you. Not any impropriety was established by you. And then you've got. Then you've got, uh, uh, then you've got uh, special special funds. Uh, you said uh, order. Uh, uh, order. I mean, Mr. 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 Speaker, Mr. Speaker. This week, this week we had uh, we had the uh, the member for Pierce. The member for Pierce, uh, in, in, when a question was put to him, this week he said, in in all this debate about who said what the about the gold that. tax and when isn't the real story. I warn the member Isn't the real that. story that politicians of all persuasions. Now listen to this. Are often under pressure from lobby groups and parties. Ultimately, make political decisions, policy decisions, as a result of that sort of pressure. Cheney, yes, but the test is the outcome. Well, yeah. the member, the test is the outcome. Yeah, right. The test is the outcome, and that you fail the test because you turned turn your party, you turned your party leader's view over, and you voted against the bills to tax the income from gold mining companies, and we didn't. And then you went on to say this week in humbug, which only you can traffic in. Only you can traffic in. In uh, press release, media release, Cheney called for end of fragmented decision making. He said, he said the government 
they said, a sense of national purpose while ensuring that it was not the creature or captive of any industry or lobby group. <laughs> he, said, the, he said, government had a key role to play in this process by giving some sense of national purpose while ensuring that it was not the creature or captive of any industry or lobby group. You see, it's only somebody with no pride whatsoever, it's only someone with the front of a Liberal front bencher could get up and say, after you have had your, had your record paraded in front of you about distortions you favour, about securing funds while impugning another man's reputation, that you can get up in a speech to the environment, a long speech, and say that there should be a sense of national purpose while ensuring. I mean, this is the sort of humbug which just makes us sick, yeah. and it's particularly made us sick about you, because you've played this little goody-goody role for years, running around the thing, sort of red Fred, you're not really a right winger, a bit tense, got a sort of social conscience. When he had the social security job, did this, did that. Said, oh, he's not a bad guy. He went around the gallery, you know, one of the sort of Lemensian type liberals, where in fact, what we find about you is you're just really red hot. You're, into, you're up your ears in any matter that can advance the partisan interests of your party. You've got very hard right wing views and you push them for all they're worth. But worse than that, you protect constituencies, as you put it. And then you go on with this humbug, this disgusting humbug. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is what we've got. This is what we've got from these people. I mean, this is a disgusting opposition, Mr. Speaker. This is not an opposition with a skerrick of integrity. It's up there. It's up there attacking, attacking the government for everything. For the Prime Minister suggesting he changed the policy. Look, look. There was a, a crude interjection from uh, one of the Victorian members down here about the Costing and Royal Commission. He made the charge to the Prime Minister that the Prime Minister had closed it down. Yes, and it established the NCA in its place. It established the NCA in its place, which you didn't mention. And the Costing and Commission opened up, opened up, lifted the rug on all the rotten, corrupt tax practices in this country, which Senator Durack, as Attorney General, had let happen despite the fact he'd been warned the famous two-year two gap in the documents which Senator Durack was given. The same Senator Durack waddling up and down St George's Terrace looking for contributions from gold mining companies, from Western Mining and all their pals down on the strip at Kalgoorlie to Kilgardie. I mean, that's what you're about. That's what you're about. And uh, this government comes along and says, well, we better make the tax system decent. We'll tax all income, including capital gains. We'll bring in a fringe benefits tax for people who've got cars and credit cards and the rest. We'll stop this ramp of entertainment being a deduction. We'll actually tax lump sum so we can set up a decent retirement incomes people for the system for the whole of community. We'll actually put an assets test on social security payments so people of real wealth don't get it. And we'll tax gold. No, no, you wouldn't have a bow of that. You've punished us for every measure. Politically, you took us to elections. You punished us for every measure. And a member for Benelong got up in the 1987 campaign and campaigned against all these things. We'll remove Labor's capital gains tax, Labor's FBT, Labor's we'll turn over entertainment and deduction, we'll remove the tax on lump sums, we'll turn over Labor's assets test. We remember, we remember, you've never done anything decent to make the tax system better. And when we have done it, particularly with gold, and especially in this case with gold, you frustrate us in the House by opposing it and then opposing it in the Senate when your then leader knew that there could be no rational case for exempting one metal against other metals. He knew it, said it, and was rolled by a front bench that has, that has sold itself to the Western Australian gold industry. So we know what policy buying means. As, uh, as my colleague, as my colleague uh, the Minister for Transport and Communication said, we know what policy buying means. You've shown us in the most vivid way, in the most graphic way that could be imagined. And yet you've got the hide to be up asking and asking me questions today about Rothwells four years ago when you know, you know clearly that the government had no involvement in that rescue package because you failed in attacking the Prime Minister, so you'll try and get up another issue. And particularly with this person who's now about to rise, where's the member for Pearce? Why isn't he speaking? Why isn't he speaking in the debate? Why isn't he up here? In fact, Mr Speaker, we'll extend the debate on this side. We'll extend the debate to allow the member for Pearce to make a contribution. And we'll see the voice. But, but to have now another cheap, tawdry political speech from the deputy leader of the opposition, uh, who, who traffics in all sorts of uh, 
and all sorts of distortions just to make a cheap political yes, point won't cut the ice. The fact yes, is, please, Mr. Please. Deputy Speaker, they have impugned the reputation of the Prime, Prime Minister and Order. failed and deserved the, the centre of the House. Time has expired.